Okay, hi everyone and welcome. My name is Brooke Christensen and I'm a PhD student in the Daily Lab at the University of California, Irvine. I'm happy to welcome you to another in a series of workshops on integrative organismal modeling of movement. This workshop is part two of a two-part series on physical models and evolutionary biology. These workshops have been sponsored by the NSF Division of Organismal Systems and will be recorded and shared as an online resource hosted through the UCI Center for Integrative Movement Sciences. And with that, thank you all for your attention today, and I'm going to hand it off to today's workshop speakers. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So I'm doing a quick introduction. If you were with us last week, we talked about how we can use physical models to learn more about biological systems. And today's workshop is all about how we actuate those models. And so Henry Astley from uh, Akron and um, Talia Moore from University of Michigan are going to be telling us all about the weird and wonderful ways you can actuate things uh, in your physical models. So we'll start with Henry. Hi, thanks very much, Jim. And uh, yeah, let's get started. I'll just uh, get my PowerPoint shared here. Let's see, hopefully oh, this works. Properly. Henry, I forgot to mention the slides are numbered and we've decided mm -hmm. for ease of communication, we're gonna address all the Q&A at the end of the presentation. So please, when you ask your question, um, note the slide that you're you're talking about, and then uh, we'll be better able. Everyone will be better able to link back to the concept. Mm -hmm. All right. Great. Thanks very much. And also, as a heads up, there is a there are a couple of demos in this where I'm going to take down the PowerPoint and show you things on my webcam. There's one of them where I'm going to simultaneously share my screen and share. Uh, um, my webcam because I want you to be able to see both what the servo is doing and my feedback response from it. So I'll tell you when we get to that one, but you'll want to like drag my little image of me talking to make that really big so that you can see the servo motor in that demo. So without further ado, let's get started and talk about actuating your physical models. Last time we talked about physical models and all the great ways you can use them in biology. So now let's talk about how to actually get them to move. And the key to this is actuators. So actuators are devices that take some sort of input energy source, ener uh, electricity, gasoline, an ion gradient, whatever, and turn that into physical force, movement, work, and or power in order to affect the environment. Uh, Talia will also talk about uh, some of these sort of definitions of actuators because she's going to cover some of the weird and wonderful new technologies uh, in this area. For my portion, I'm sticking to the basics, the sort of simple things that you can easily buy online for sort of very simple or uh, very straightforward, uh, not terribly advanced uh, stuff. But at any rate, uh, so there's a lot of different actuators available. We're going to talk about several of the different options and the key to this is that there is no perfect actuator. Every actuator has some sort of limitations. It might have limited limitations in terms of its force, the displacement it's capable of, speed. It might have terrible efficiency, uh, control. How controllable is it? How precise is it? Uh, power consumption, all sorts of different things. Uh, size is another one. You might simply not be able to miniaturize others or not be able to scale them up effectively. So every actuator has its limits. And it's important to, for your particular project, knowing how fast you want something to move, how strong you want it to move, um, how much control you need to have, how big does it need to be to pick the actuator that suits your needs. So the best choice for something that's human size might not be the best choice for something that's mouse size or especially insect sized. And it's also not just robots. Um, I know Talia and myself both make robots, but for you can use these for all sorts of things, opening and closing valves or doors, moving objects, making cameras track objects, dispensing treats to an animal to reward it after finishing a maze, whatever. Uh, there's lots of different things that you can do with actuators. So I'll start out with uh, hydraulics slash pneumatics, because they're both sort of two sides of the same coin. And they're sort of 
on the edge of actuators, depending on how you use them and how you define the term actuator. Um, these things convert pressure energy into mechanical work, which does fit the definition. You have some pressurized fluid and you result in the movement of a piston. But something else has to create that pressure energy. This could be a motor pushing on one piston and it moves the other. It could be a pump that's pumping fluid into the system. It could be uh, internal combustion, like your car engine. Um, but something else has to create that pressure. So if you're, uh, at any rate, you can basically consider these systems as like a fluidic lever system. So it's just like your good old lever system where you can set the in lever and the out lever to amplify force or amplify displacement. Same thing here, except instead of having a nice rigid lever, you've got this fluid connection, which can be flexible and you can connect things via pipes, which means that you can have these flexible pipes that go anywhere. Um, but Looking at this example that I pulled off of Wikipedia, you can see if I've got this little piston on the left here and I'm pushing down with a force F1 onto a small piston area A1, then I'm going to have a pressure of F1 over A2 newtons per square meter. And this is the pressure that will be transmitted through the entire fluid. So if I push down with, you know, 200 kilopascals of pressure uh, at the, the piston on the left, the piston on the right will also be subject to 200 kilopascals of pressure. The piston on the right, however, has a much bigger area. And this means that that pressure is multiplied by a much larger area and you get a much larger force out. So this little piston, a little bit of force on, he, on the piston on the left produces a lot of force on the piston on the right, just like a lever system. And just like a lever system, you have this trade-off with displacement and velocity. If I push F1 down, I displace 10 milliliters of liquid. If F2, if the other side is 10 times as big, it still has 10 milliliters that are going to go up, but it's going to move up a tenth as much. So if you're if you're multiplying the force by 10, you're going to drop your displacement tenfold. If you're reducing the force by a half, you're going to have double your displacement, just like a lever system. Um, <clears throat> so you have two options, as I mentioned for this, hydraulics, which use liquid, usually some sort of hydraulic oil, and pneumatics, which use gases, usually room air because it's easily available, but you can also have compressed gas. Um, and there are benefits and drawbacks to both. So pneumatics, air is, and gases are compressible and liquids aren't. So if you opt for the air-based system, it's springy. You have this, this springy system where you can, you can push down on both levers in the system and just compress the gas. So this gives it some springiness to it. And it also means that you have very poor position control. You don't really know what the where any particular lever is unless you have an additional sensor on it. Um, however, it's much faster and there are far fewer losses in the pipes because air and other gases are much less viscous and much less dense than liquids. So it works really well if you need something to move fast. And especially if you want that springiness, if you want something like a series elastic actuator, or you're modeling something as like an animal with a tendon, this gives you a level of springiness. If you use a, if you use a liquid, it's incompressible, and so there's no springiness, which means you have good position control and it's completely rigid, like a nice rigid lever. I push down on F1, F2 must move up according to the area ratios. There's no compressibility. The downside is because liquids are much more viscous and much denser, they are much slower and you get high losses and it requires a lot of force to move these things. So, like I said, all actuators have advantages and disadvantages. So the advantages and disadvantages of these systems are they can generate tremendous forces with great ease. They have good position control if they're liquid. They have an inherent springiness if they're gaseous and they're quite reliable. They can go through lots and lots of cycles without terribly much wear and tear, especially if you keep them well oiled. 
Uh, the disadvantages are that just like us, they require a high pressure circulatory system. And just like us, leaks disable them. So if all the liquid leaks out, just like us, we stop working. And so do the hydraulics or pneumatics. Um, they have poor scaling. Um, they work fantastic for really big things like this excavator. But as soon as you start trying to make them smaller and smaller and smaller, it gets harder and harder to make them effective. Valves don't scale well. The losses that you get in pipes scale to the uh, radius to the fourth. It's, it gets really hard to make small hydraulic or pneumatic systems. Um, if they're gaseous, you lose out on uh, position control. If they're liquid, then you have high losses and they tend to be very heavy. Um, the tubes themselves take up significant space and you need something else to produce the movement. You need a pump, you need a motor that's pushing on one of the other. If you have two pistons like this case, something needs to push on one of the pistons to make the others move, which is why it's sort of on the edge of an actuator. And common uses are things like construction machinery, high force manufacturing equipment. I have a student who is currently building a burrowing robot using hydraulic pistons that we actually got off eBay because they're meant for children's toys of these sort of excavators. Um, so yeah, it is possible to get somewhat small ones, but even those are quite large, like 90 centimeters long. So electric motors, electric motors are the bulk of this. They are the go-to actuator for just about everything. 90% uh, of the time, if you need to actuate something, there's gonna be an electric motor that can do it uh, because our world runs on electricity. So electric motors use electromagnetic force um, to create rotational motion and torque. So. There are a few linear versions out there. They are rare and expensive and not terribly common. 99.9% .9 of the electric motors are fundamentally rotational in nature. Um, so this can be a problem because muscles are not rotational if you're trying to copy them, but a little bit of engineering and you can find a way to convert it to linear motion, or you can just put these at the joints as is pretty common. There are all sorts of advantages to these. One of them is that they are cheap, they are mass produced, they're scalable, powerful, and have a ton of variation. You can buy a huge array of electric motors ranging from gigantic five horsepower monstrosities that are capable of tremendous and even dangerous torques and RPMs down to tiny little pager motors, if anyone here was alive in the 90s or pagers and little vibrating motors. You can buy super tiny ones. They generally tend to be high RPM. They tend to move at thousands of revolutions per minute uh, if unloaded. Loading them will slow them down. We'll talk about that a bit later. Um, and you can also put gear systems, uh, you know, transmissions in them to reduce that and get from high RPM and low force or low torque down to high torque, low RPM. But that means adding a gear system. Um, they do cause electromagnetic noise. They are fundamentally a bunch of uh, magnets and magnetized coils turning on and off very, very frequently. So if you have an electric motor and you are also doing EMG, you might have a bad time. Um, at the very least, you're going to need to do a lot more data filtration uh, to deal with the electrical noise that these things produce. You can reduce this by wrapping things in aluminum foil. Um, but again, you just because you have this thing around, if it's on, it's gonna start generating noise. So how do these things work? So we'll start with a very simple version, the brushed DC motor. And we'll talk about why it's called brushed in a second. And so fundamentally, you just have this roughly square loop of wire that you can see in gray in this animated GIF, also from Wikipedia. They're really good for things like this. So you send an electrical current through this square sort of loop of wire. And on the left and the right are a pair of magnets, north and south, giving you a uniform electrical field shown in the yellow arrows. And so when this coil is horizontal in our field of view from this particular picture, and you run current through it, it's going to generate its own magnetic field. 
and it's go there's going to be a torque. You can see the sort of the resultant force uh, in the green arrows. There's going to be this torque that pulls this loop of wire until it reaches vertical. And so the torque magnitude, as you can see from here, the arrows become increasingly aligned with the axis and the torque magnitude will drop to zero when it's vertical, which isn't terribly useful. And so what most real systems do is they have this magnetic field and then they have many, many of these loops that are turned on and off in sequence so that only the one that's in the best position for generating torque will actually be electrically active. And as soon as its torque starts to diminish, it drops and a new one turns on. And how they do that in this system is actually quite straightforward and simple. They simply have this thing called a commutator, which in, is in cyan, and it's literally just pieces of metal. And so when the commutator is in contact with the brushes, which are these black uh, black squares that you see connecting to the circle, those form an electrical contact and current flows through the wire and you get torque. And as soon as it disconnects, the torque stops. And then when it flips, when it goes past vertical and starts coming around the other way, the commutator will connect again and now the current will go in the opposite direction. And so a real motor, this is just a very simplified diagram, will have many, many loops, and the commutator will take up a much smaller angular portion of the rotation. But fundamentally, it's just a sliding contact between the commutator and the brushes, and you're just sort of holding the wires together via sort of friction and force. And this is the fundamental problem with brushed DC motors. These brushes will eventually wear out, and when they wear out, it's dead, it's a paperweight. You've lost your electrical contact and you can't do anything with it. So this is a limitation. They don't have a fantastic lifespan. However, because they are cheap and easy to make, they are very popular. They're easy to control, they're powerful, they're cheap. There's a huge range of sizes and models. Just be aware if you're budgeting in a grant, these are a consumable. They're not a permanent uh, device. You'll use them for you know, a few tens of thousands of rotations, 100,000 rotations, and that's it. They, they're worn out and you'll have to replace them. But they're cheap enough and versatile enough that I wouldn't really worry about that. Um, I've used them quite a bit. They're, they're really quite useful and quite affordable. Um, even the high power ones. So how do you actually control them? How do you actually make it do what you want it to do? Um, one of the things that we've mentioned in the previous lecture is uh, physical models are fantastic because they do what you tell them to do. So part of this, uh, this workshop is how do you tell it to do that? So your typical brush DC motor will have this torque RPM trade-off that you can see in this graph that I made up. This is a fictional graph in Excel, but they will have this nice linear relationship in blue between torque and RPM. And so at zero RPM, they have maximum torque. At, at no torque, they have maximum RPM. So think of it like a muscle force velocity relationship, just not curved. And just like a muscle force velocity relationship, there's a power curve. And because unlike a muscle, it's not curved, uh, there's no curve to the torque RPM curve, this is a nice symmetrical parabola that peaks at 50% of max RPM, and that gives you maximum power. Torque and current. Current is proportional to torque, but there is always some baseline current. So even at zero torque, if, you have, if it's completely unloaded and it's running at 10,000 RPM, there is still some current. But as torque goes up, current goes up. And so because current goes up and there is some offset and you've got this power, you wind up with this light sort of yellow efficiency curve where you get your best efficiency close to max RPM and then it drops steadily. So a key aspect of this is that these motors will slow down automatically. If you just take a DC motor and plug it in and you know, it'll spin at max RPM. And then if you pinch the axle, do this with a small one so you don't hurt it, hurt yourself, but pinch the axle, 
and it'll slow down. Pinch it harder, it'll slow down even more. So basically, if you want them to go slow, you can just load them up with high torque. A caveat for this is that high torques also involve high current, which can be damaging. You want to stay away from high torques. In fact, the entire top third of your torque range is this sort of danger zone where you're in danger of it literally melting the wires due to excessive current. So you want to stay away from the top third of your torque range. The middle third is where you want to do intermittent operation. You want this motor to occasionally turn on and then turn off again and give itself time to sort of cool. And then the bottom third, you're safe for continuous operation. Um, you can swap the wires in order to change its direction. So if you plug it in, it's spinning clockwise, swap the wires, the, the voltage in the ground, and it'll spin counterclockwise. You can do this physically with your hands, or you can do this electronically using a device called an H-bridge. It's this little chip. You can buy them on SparkFun or any DigiKey or a hundred other providers, and you can send a digital signal that will basically say flip direction. So this way you can change its direction, but what do you wanna do if you wanna control the torque more finely? So increasing voltage will increase both the no load RPM and the stall torque proportionally, and the slope remains constant. So you can see in this graph on the bottom, as you increase the voltage that you're applying to your, um, to your motor, then you get this, this, the slope is constant, if you have some fixed torque that is just what your machine is experiencing due to the physics of whatever you have put it in, then increasing the voltage will in effectively increase its speed. So if you want it to slow down and you can just decrease the voltage. So you can do this to control your speed and torque. And you can do this two ways. One of them is just changing the overall voltage but that can be kind of a pain in the butt. So a more common method is something called pulse width modulation. So what this does is it sends a square wave to your motor and it's usually at something really high like 100 to 500 Hertz. Uh, and the idea is that because you're turning it off and on again so fast, the motor effectively doesn't notice the difference and it behaves as if it's the intermediate voltage. So if I had 10 volts and I used a 50% duty factor, then it would effectively be like it was five volts or this thing is using five volts. So a 50% duty factor would be like 2.5, a 25% duty factor would be like 1.25, so on and so forth. So you can use this to control your voltage and many controller systems are, are capable of this, Arduinos, Beagle bones, pretty much anything that's capable of pulse width modulation can control a simple, um, a simple brushed motor. So these things are great because they are cheap. They have a huge range of sizes available. You can buy great big ones, sometimes with gear trains already built into them, sometimes not as you want. They're easy to use. I mean, it's literally just two wires and all you're doing is changing the voltage across those wires. They're quite powerful. Um, and as I said, they can be connected to gears, but also things like linkages or rack and pinion systems to change your torque or force or change it from rotational to linear motion or oscillating or what have you. The downside is that they are intrinsically rotational. So in order to convert it to say linear motion, then you need to add these extra mechanical systems, which are extra weight, extra cost, extra complexity, extra things to break. Um, and they only function in continuous motion. If you get to stall torque, you're in trouble. So you cannot use these. You can use these to spin continuously at whatever speed you want, aside from the torque limits. But if you stall this thing out, it will burn up. You cannot safely hold position unless you have some sort of complicated control circuitry. And fortunately, the people realized that that would be a really useful thing to do, built this complicated control circuitry and packaged it in what are called servo motors. Servo motors are simply 
brushed DC motors that have a transmission gear train that makes them go from high RPM and low torque to high torque and low RPM, as well as a potentiometer, a little uh, sensor that detects the position of this little, you can see this sort of uh, blue horn on the very top here. Um, this is what moves, it detects its position, and there's the complicated controller circuit that you can see in the base, and that sort of, it's hidden away, and you can see the cutaway aside to show you, and this thing will hold positions. Um, so you can say, go to this position, and it will go there, and it will hold that position, and fight anything that tries to, to push it past that position or uh, impede it from that position. And servo motors, probably the biggest benefit is their popularity. You are spoiled for choice. If you go to servocity.com, Palulu, any place, just Google you know, servo motors for sale and you'll find a dozen sites with literally hundreds, sometimes thousands of different models big ones, small ones, high speed, high torque. You can get a bag of 10 servo motors for seven bucks on Amazon, or you can pay $80 per servo, depending on what you want. There are really fancy and really high power ones. The cheap ones are cheap and crappy and what you'd expect for 10 servos for $7 on Amazon. You can get waterproof ones. You can get ones in slightly different shapes, although there is some limitations on that just due to the technology. This is driven by a huge hobby robotics community as well as previously RC car plane and ship enthusiasts. So there's just a huge array of choice, which is really useful because whatever you need, there's probably a servo motor for it unless it's really big. Uh, so purpose of the servo motor is to go to a commanded position. That's literally it. You say, go to this position and it will go there as fast and as hard as it can. And, you know, no matter what, but that's it. That's really all it does. Your typical servo motor can move in either a 90 or 180 degree range. You cannot do continuous rotation. Um, there are some custom versions that can rotate continuously, and I'll show you one later, but they are rare. Some of them have digital stops in their control circuit that limit how far they can turn. Others have physical limits where there's actually a physical piece of metal or plastic that stops them exceeding the maximum rotation can damage your servo motor. So it's not just that, you know, oh yeah, they can go 90 or 180, but you can push them a little farther. No, you might physically crack the servo motor if you push it too far. Um, so speed of them can vary, but most of them are geared for high force, which is useful to us because that's usually more where we're going. They probably won't work if you're trying to make a mantis shrimp robot, but say a reaching arm or in my case, a snake robot, servos work great. So what do these things look like and how do you actually use them? So your typical run-of-the-mill servo motor will look this sort of somewhat tall rectangle with a off-center rotating portion sticking up with this little silver knob. They'll usually have little plastic or metal horns, they call them, that attach to it. And it'll have three wires, which frustratingly are not always the same color. Power is always red. It's usually the middle one, but you know, check. Any servo you get, you can just Google it and find a data sheet. So if I, this particular servo is an MG90S, if you just go right now and Google MG90S, you will find a sheet that tells you which, uh, which cable is which. Power is always red. Ground is usually black or brown and signal which is what tells the servo motor where to go, is usually yellow or orange, but I have seen other colors. When all else fails, check the documentation. One thing I will say is that servos are power hungry. Most controllers, things like Arduinos, they are capable of running one servo motor, especially if it's a small one. They can power it on their own, but any large servo motor and especially multi-servo motors, like if you have like four servo motors to make your robot, 
the, those controllers just cannot handle it. They do not, they have the voltage, but they don't have the current output to do it. And so the best practice is you can use batteries. I like to use power supplies because batteries run out and the voltage drops. And so the best practice is a dedicated DC power supply like this one. You can find these also online for a couple hundred bucks. You can also use the quote wall warts like the things you use to charge your phone they're not as precise but they can work um so these will provide power you can connect these to just give power and ground to your servo and then connect the signal wire to your controller such as an arduino but a crucial note is that if you do this the ground of both your controller and your power supply have to be connected Otherwise, they won't, essentially, they won't really know where ground is relative to each other. And so you get some really weird behaviors. So you have to connect the ground to both of them. It's literally called common ground. Um, <clears throat> and finally, one note is that low voltage or current or excessively high voltage or current will cause bizarre behaviors. If you undervolt a regular DC brushed motor, it'll just be slow and weak. If you undervolt a servo motor, there isn't enough voltage to run that control circuit properly. And it starts doing weird things like jittering back and forth and spinning more than 360 degrees, in which case it can literally break itself. So you have to be more careful with voltage with these. Um, most servo motors will have a range, uh, so 3.5 or 3.7 for some, or 3.3 for some small ones, 5, 7.4 for some of the big ones. You can go above this range, but it will substantially reduce your lifespan. So if you have a 7.4 volt servo, you can give it 8.49 volts, but you're going to go from something that does 10,000 uh, oscillations in its lifetime to a thousand oscillations. So you will pay a price in terms of servo lifetime and it's pretty substantial. It's better just to get bigger servos. So that covers power. What about signal? So the control is actually just based on a modified version of pulse width modulation. So pulse width modulation for um, DC motors is just the ratio of time on to time off duty factor. Those of us who are uh, using uh, new still working on locomotion or use the duty factor. This version is somewhat different. Um, the default PWM is what I talked about previously, high frequency with a duty factor, time on, time off, gives continuous rotation. Servo pulse width modulation has a frequency of 50 hertz, and the duration of the pulse encodes the target position. So if the pulse, this is milliseconds, it's commonly spoken of in microseconds, but uh, so if the pulse is 1500 microseconds, that's telling the servo motor to point straight ahead. Um, and then 1000 microseconds is 45 degrees, uh, 500 microseconds is zero degrees to the left, and conversely, you know, 2000 and 2500 microseconds are 45 and 90 degrees to the right. Um, it's not just limited to these five. You can have any intermediate state that you want. That said, do not expect sub-degree precision from these things. You can trust a servo motor to get plus or minus about three degrees of where it's supposed to go, maybe two if it's a high quality one, maybe plus or minus five if it's a low quality one, but don't assume that it's going to be capable of very small changes. Um, and related to that, if it's a cheap servo motor, especially check that 1500 really is straight ahead because it isn't always. Um, and you might just need to add something to your code to account for a slight offset due to manufacturing errors. So how do you send this servo pulse width modulation? So there are a variety of controllers that you can use. The Arduino is one that I use quite frequently. Um, it's you know very common little microcontroller tiny little low power computer and its default version the Arduino Uno can control up to five servo motors 
there are other versions and add-ons that will let you control up to 18. But remember, you're going to need an extra power supply to do this. Um, it has a built-in control library, uh, servo.h. We'll talk about that next slide in Arduino's native language. But it's only capable of very simple commands, which is not that big of a deal because servo motors really aren't that complicated. Um, it's standalone. There's no need for a computer. The Arduino itself is a small, very weak computer. And so if you need a robot to be autonomous or, or just connected with a power cord, then an Arduino is a great solution. Another one that I've used is what's called the Lynx Motion. Uh, the SSC32 is my, uh, my favorite. And it can control up to 32 servo motors at once, and it has more sophisticated commands. So if I, if I have a servo motor that's pointing straight ahead and I say, I want to go far right, it will just go as far right as it can, as fast and hard as it can, given its torque limits. With a Lynx motion, I can say, I want to go from 90 degrees to all the way to the right, and I want it to take one second to do so. And the Lynx motion will internally control it and sort of send the commands necessary to make that smooth motion, which is nice, um, especially for snake robots like I make. Um, the downside is that it is not a standalone computer. You do need a computer connected to it to send commands via USB. Uh, there are other options. I just haven't personally used them. Raspberry Pi, BeagleBoat, Lulu makes a variety of servo motor um, controllers. So I'm going to do a quick little demo using uh, a servo motor and an Arduino. And I am just going to stop sharing to do this, and then I'll come back and review the code. And so there we go. This is not going to be the world's most impressive demo. In fact, this is literally the default example that comes with your Arduino. And so here we go. So you can see, oops, let's try to get it to focus on the servo, not my face. There we go. So you can see it's basically just moving back and forth. And, and we'll discuss the code, what I'm doing, but it's slowly rotating back and forth. It's not quite making it through 180 degrees, but yeah. And that's pretty much all there is to it. So if I go back to share screen. Go. All right, so this is the code that I use to do this. And it's literally, this is all there is to it. Um, there's literally pound include servo.h. That's the, the library of servo commands that, the R, that tells the Arduino how to use the servo motor. Here, servo, my servo, I'm declaring, I'm giving the servo a name. I'm saying, here's a variable which is a type, a servo motor, and I'm naming it my servo. I could call it whatever I wanted. If I was doing a multi-leg robot, I could have several of these, and it could be servo leg one, servo leg two, servo leg three, or servo hip joint, servo elbow joint, servo wrist joint, whatever. And I make a little variable for its position. This one here, um, my servo dot attach nine. This is literally just saying that the, the control pin that I showed on the servo motor is physically connected to pin number nine on the Arduino board. The Arduino board has a bunch of little numbered pins you can plug things into. Some of them have a little wiggly line next to them, a little tilde. That means that they are capable of controlling a servo motor at that pin. One of them is number nine. And then all I'm doing in the rest of the code is I just have a little for loop where I say, go from zero to 180 degrees. And you get the smooth motion that you see from that servo motor because I basically, I'm saying, go to position zero, wait for 15 milliseconds. Position one, wait for 15 milliseconds. Two, wait, three, four, five, six, da, 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 da. And then when it gets to 180, it finishes and then it goes in the other direction. This is pretty much all servos can do. They do, servos do one thing. They go to a particular position. They do it really, really well, but it's one thing. So 
it's this is another case of like what do you need your your actuator to do and how do you make it work so i did want to take a moment to talk about there is another option for servo motors um this is the ones that i've been using most recently in my robots called Dynamixel servos. It's a particular company, Robotis Incorporated, that has uh, these abilities. So a few servos will offer position feedback, which includes absolute position, but that's rarely useful because getting position feedback, the position of your servo motor should be the position that you send it. And if not, you are in deep trouble. And if it doesn't resolve itself quickly, the servo motor will break. Um, so yeah, those are sort of limited usefulness. So very few servo motors have feedback. The Dynamixel ones that I've been using, um, these actually have quite sophisticated control and can be quite useful for uh, biological, physical models of animals. Like I said, I've been using them for snake robots for quite some time. Um, they have essentially, uh, should say extensive, they are onboard software. So imagine these things as basically a servo motor with an entire Arduino already packed into them. So they've got really complex control that's already built inside every servo. And as a result, they can do all sorts of stuff. They can switch between servo motor mode and wheel mode. So they can go from 180 degrees of range. They actually have an extended servo motor range where they can go beyond, they can go beyond 360 rotation. They can switch to a wheel mode where they just spin continuously. Um, you can get a ton of different feedback from them. Current, which corresponds to torque, temperature, position, uh, if you're in uh, servo mode, speed, if you're in wheel mode, the voltage that they're currently at. You can do things like specify what the peak torque is or even turn the torque on and off um, in order to get feedback. You can specify what you want the peak speed to be for these motors. You can change the acceleration profile. So if the servo motor, a traditional servo motor, you say, hold this position, you say, go somewhere else, it just instantly is at max, you know, immediately. The Dynamixels, you can say, oh, I just want you to use this constant speed, or I want you to slowly ramp up your speed. You can specify this in software, and change it while they are in use. Um, you, as I said, you can enable and disable torques. You can daisy chain the wires like it shows you in this. Each servo motor has an identity that you internally code, one, zero, da, 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 up to 256. And as a result, you can connect your three wires to one of them, and then that sends three wires to the next. And so, I'll have an entire snake robot with a dozen servo motors or two dozen, and it literally just has three wires coming out of the back. If I had a dozen servo motors in a traditional servo motors in a snake robot, I'd have 36 wires coming out the back of a snake robot, which can be a little difficult to manage. They also have full PID control. So that's beyond the scope of what we can cover in this workshop, but this is a uh, Fairly sophisticated control, uh, proportional control is very much similar to springiness, and derivative control is similar to a damper, but there is a whole area of control theory. I'm going to have to let y'all uh, examine that on your own, but you can do some really sophisticated control stuff. And again, you can control, change your, your control coefficients with this on the fly while the robot is moving. The downside of this is they are more caught, they're more they're more capable, so they're more complicated to use, and they are much more costly. The cheapest one, you know, there's no bag of 10 for five bucks on Amazon thing. The cheapest one is 25 bucks per motor. The more expensive ones go to $1,000 a motor to call us for a quote, and I've never called them for a quote, because as much as I love them, I don't love them that much. <clears throat> so, I'm gonna do a quick demo with this. Now, this is the one where I'm gonna start the motor and what you're gonna do, I'm gonna start sharing the screen and you're gonna to wanna to drag the window that has my picture in it to make it larger so that you can see both the shared screen and me because I'm gonna be, you don't really care about me, you care about seeing the servo motor because I'm gonna hold it up and show you some of the things that it can do. And so, there we go. Get us all started and connected. 
Alrighty. So, load. All connected. We are good to go. And finish compiling. Already. Now, share screen. Here. So you should all be able to see a little screen that says position command demo, as well as my face, and more importantly, my motor. So what I'm doing now is I'm just sending the same exact sort of thing that I sent previously on the traditional servo. So these things can do what traditional servos do with no problem. Go to this position, go back. You know, big deal. Is everyone seeing that position command demo sort of window up there? Hopefully so. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay, good. All right. So it just says done. And so now we are in position feedback. So what I've done is I've turned the torque off and I can freely move the motor and you can see the numbers changing and those numbers correspond to the position. You can see it gets to around about a thousand here raises up to around about two here, starts getting close to 3,000 here, and then eventually I sort of run into the wires. And now here, we're in force feedback mode. So the torque has been re-enabled, and I'm pushing on it. I push to the right, and you can see the torque increasing. I have to be a little bit careful because one of the great things about these is if you push this thing too far and it gets to a damaging level of torque, it will simply turn off internally and protect itself. And then I have to unplug the servo motor and all that sort of stuff, but it has an internal safety cut off, but you can get some degree of torque uh, feedback off of this. I have not tested just how precise this is. You can also specify the compliance. So here I've set it for uh, medium compliance and I push on it and it acts like a spring. And you can see the position feedback in the window. You can see it being springy here. Either direction is fine. And so I can get this sort of springiness. You'll note that it doesn't always return to the exact same spot because like regular servos, it has a gear train. So there is some passive frictional resistance. So now it's in the most compliant configuration. And so I've got a very loose spring now. And now you can really see that it doesn't always go back to the middle when it should, because again, it's running into that passive friction from the uh, gear train that's just sort of an unavoidable consequence of servo motors. And then next, it's going to put it in the stiffer position. See, hey, because it's pure position, it add a little bit of a jitter there. So you sometimes have to be careful with switching these. Don't jump from uh, soft to firm. But here you can see it's a lot firmer in terms of how much how much force it takes me to move this thing. I, I can't go past a certain point, otherwise it will just overload and fail. So they're capable of quite a lot of interesting things. All right, I could stop that now and go back to the PowerPoint. Share. So I'm not showing the code for this because it is actually quite long and involved, but the code will be posted on the IOMM site. And so there'll be just a little uh, DXL demo.ino. It's an Arduino. The controller for these things is basically a modified Arduino. And you can actually buy a shield for, uh, con for controlling Dynamixels with a regular Arduino. So um, without further ado, and to finish this off before I take up too much time, Assuming I can get this working. Here we go. So pros and cons of servo motors as a whole. Servos are cheap. They are not as cheap as DC motors, but still quite affordable. Uh, for those of you who might be on a budget, uh, they're not going to be you know thousand dollars a servo unless you want those really fancy Dynamixels. There's a huge variety available. Um, they're easy to control. They come with built-in attachment points. They literally have plastic flanges that stick out that you can screw them to things fairly strong and fast. They have consistent positions built in. You don't need to zero them. If you turn it off and turn it on again and say go to 90 degrees, it'll go to the same spot every time. The disadvantages is most of them lack feedback or sophisticated control unless you go with a Dynamixel. They don't have continuous rotation abilities. 
if they fail or are undervolted, they can lock up, they can jitter, they can spin wildly and do all sorts of terrible things. Smaller models can be fairly fragile. I've dropped them and broken them before. The bigger ones are much more robust. The bulky form factor can be somewhat limiting. You have to design your robot around the motor that you picked. And you need three wires per servo unless you're going dynamixels. Finally, I thought I'd just briefly mention one last type which are of motors, which are stepper motors, or one last that I'll cover, and then I'll hand it over to Talia. So stepper motors are basically a series of coils to force a magnetized rotor, the sort of the spinny bit of the motor, to align with this magnetic field. So in this case, in the sort of the top figure, they've magnetized S3, and so that's the south pole, so of course the north on the rotor aligns with it. And by turning on and off combinations of these motor of these rotors, you can essentially rotate this thing slowly around this set. So you can turn on S2 as also south, and it'll turn 45 degrees, and then turn off S3, and then it'll go another 45. And so the great thing about these is the motor will hold its position in alignment with these magnetic fields and resist attempts to move it. And for particular versions, it can be very, very precise, like a degree or so precise. They're really, really great for this. The movement is by controlling these coils, powering them on and off in sequence. Sometimes two of them are on at once, uh, sometimes just one. Simple systems can take steps of 45 degrees. But more complex ones can have resolutions down to a few degrees. And then if you put a gear train or a worm gear, in with them, they can have fractions of a degree of precision and they will hold that position very strongly. So controlling them is a bit of a pain. I'm not gonna do a demo with this. It requires a dedicated control circuit. There's typically six wires in or more, four to six out, um, one control circuit per motor. So if you're trying to build multiple motors, it quickly becomes unfeasible. Arduino and other controllers do have libraries for their use. They can be commanded to take a single step, which could be a fraction of a degree, or multiple steps in sequence in either direction. They are intrinsically rotational. A crucial note is that they do not have any sense of their absolute position. If you say go 10 steps clockwise or 10 steps counterclockwise, they'll do that. But if you turn it off and then turn it using your, your hand, it doesn't know. And then if you turn it back on again, it'll just take 10 steps past wherever you left it. So this has the downside that you don't have an absolute sense of your position. But you could fix this yourself with additional sensors. Um, so their advantages are they have excellent accuracy. They hold position with very high torque. The torque increases when you're attempting to deflect them from their programmed position. The disadvantages is they are heavy. Even the smallest ones are bigger than many servos and uh, most brushed motors. Um, they have more complex control circuitry. They have no sense of absolute position. They are quite slow, um, about a tenth of the speed of a servo, I'd say, usually even less than that. There are far fewer models. These are almost never used for robots unless you, um, unless you need, um, really, really high precision. So usually people use servo motors instead. These are most often actually used in 3D printers, the fused filament printers, and sometimes moving the platform on the liquid printers uh, uses stepper motors. But with that, I'm going to finish up with the boring parts of the sort of the, the simple, easy, and commonly commercially available motors and hand it over to Talia, who's going to tell you about the new and exciting servo motor or actuators that are coming down the pipe, including some of the awesome ones that she's working on. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to you, Talia. Thanks, Henry. That was awesome. Um, I'm going to share my screen real quick. And I want to be there. Okay. 
All right, so I'm gonna tell you about some exotic actuators. Um, and I really wanna thank Professor Bob Full at Berkeley for sharing his bio design curriculum with me. And one of my master's students, Karthik Erz, for teaching me a lot about motors in particular. Um, my goals for this portion of the workshop are to categorize different types of actuation, um, to, to discuss characteristics and applications of each type of actuation, and then present examples of each type of actuator. So I just kind of, I'm not going to go quite as deep, not nearly as deep. Um, I'm going much more for breadth here. Okay, so here are the general categories that I'm going to cover today. We're going to go over electric, fluidic, um, thermal, and evaporative. Um, and we'll start with electric, but we're going to break that down into multiple different subcategories, electrodynamic, electrostatic, and then piezoelectric. Electrodynamic is what we think of as traditional motors. Um, and if we look at kind of this uh, phylogeny almost of motors, uh, there are a lot. As Henry said, there's probably a motor for anything you wanna do um, out in the world. Um, one or two that I'm gonna talk about right now are the brushless DC and the permanent magnet synchronous motors. They're basically the same, but I'll talk a little bit about why they're a, a different from each other as well. So they're somewhat similar to the stepper motors in that they have a permanent magnet in the center um, or a permanent magnet with the rotor that's rotating. And then they have um, different amounts or different parts called the stator that will um, change their magnetic fields and then cause that rotor to rotate. That rotor can either be in the inside of the stator or on the outside. So the inside, it would be an inner rotating and on the outside, that would be an outer rotating. So they call them in-runner or out-runner motors. Um, these are really great uh, because they have no sparks, no mechanical wear. They have really high reliability, a long lifespan, and they're pretty much maintenance free. Um, they're also back drivable, so if you want to force them backwards, that's okay. Um, they've been, they used to be really, really expensive and really rare, but now that people are making drones, um, these have become really popular for pr controlling propeller blades on the drones. Um, so what's kind of the difference between PMSMs and brushless DC motors? Well, brushless DC motors have a Hall effect sensor, whereas the PMSMs have an encoder. And so the Hall effect sensor has about a 60 degree resolution, whereas the encoder has about a one degree resolution. So you can really accurately and directly control motor torque independent of speed. Um, we use PMSM specifically to create these lightweight actuators for rapid leg oscillations. Um, one of my master's students, Karthik Erz, has come up with a totally 3D printed uh, gearbox for an actuator or for a, a motor. This is the um, T motor RI50, the inner rotating 50 motor, and it costs about $61. Here's just like a preview of the kind of system we could make using this motor. All of this is open access and the designs are available on our website at emberlab.com slash 3dp actuator as you'll see there. So I highly encourage you to, to try it out. We've fully characterized this actuator. This paper we're actually presenting at the IROS conference um, in, in Japan in, uh, in October. So um, take a look at the paper because we we show that even though it's made out of plastic, it can do pretty much as well as the metallic actuators that you see more commonly in robots like MIT Mini Cheetah. So MIT Mini Cheetah also uses PMSMs to have this really high force output for these much smaller and faster moving robots. Um, something that we can do with motors, these traditional electro electrodynamic motors, um, to get maybe slightly more um, biological like motion is to put the motor in the gearbox in series with a spring. Um, and that's what we would call a series elastic actuator. 
You can do this with a hydraulic or an electric actuator. Um, you can do this in a lot of different ways. So one of my colleagues at Michigan uses series elastic actuation to create an open source prosthetic leg, which is also totally freely available. The plans are available online. So you can build one of these yourself if you want. Um, series elastic actuators are really quite popular because um, they create slightly more biological like behavior and shock absorbance. They have high continuous power. They can store and return energy to increase efficiency and they're quieter um, than some other motors. Again, for the kind of damping with series elastic actuation, you can take a look at that active damping and then the passive compliance that you get just from the springy element in series with the motor. And this is from ETH, this is Marco Hutter's group. All right, so now we're gonna talk about electrostatic actuators. Electrostatic actuators are um, these fun actuators where you've got kind of this compliant electrode on the top and the bottom of a surface, and then you sandwich between them some kind of polymer film. And so when you run a charge through um, those electrodes, it squishes and, and kind of pulls those two ends of the sandwich together and it spreads out the polymer. So that's the basic functional element of these electroactive polymers or EAPs. Now these EAPs can, are really versatile. So this first one is, is lifting a very heavy load. The next one is really stretchy and deformable. You can use these to power a legged walking robot or even a hopping robot. And SRI um, has done a lot of wonderful work with these EAPs. Um, another thing you can do to try and find out what kind of uh, behavior you're trying to get out of these EAPs is you can do something similar to what we've done in um, animal muscle and doing a work loop technique. So you hold it at a certain length, you activate it, and then you measure the change in length. Right, So you can do that with normal muscle, you can do that with these artificial muscle, these EAPs as well. And when you plot out um, the, the power output as a function of frequency for a bunch of different animals, um, it turns out that with these EAPs, you can change out which type of polymer you have on the inside of that sandwich. So for example, if you use silicone, you get this kind of behavior. And if you use acrylic, you get this kind of behavior. So these EAPs have the behavior that's within the natural range of natural muscle. Um, and you can kind of pick and choose the behavior that you want by putting in the type of filling in your sandwich that you want. So slightly related to this um, is a dielectric fluid actuator. So instead of putting in this kind of polymer gel squishy thing, um, you can also put in just a dielectric fluid. And these are called hazel actuators. Um, and they've been invented by Keplinger et al, who used to be at CU Boulder and now is in um, a Max Planck in Germany. So they've got the same electrode, a compliant electrode on the top and the bottom, but they're around an elastomeric shell. And so when you apply that charge, it squeezes the electrodes together and then creates um, these areas of expansion. And so it's kind of a mixture between an electric uh, actuator and a soft actuator, like a fluidic actuator, like Henry was talking about earlier. Um, these actuators can be used for a lot of different things. They can be made in different shapes. And again, they can lift heavy loads um, and they're soft, so they can be very, very delicate and do things like grab a raspberry without damaging it. Okay, so now let's talk about piezoelectric actuators. All right, you probably already know this, but when I learned this, um, it blew my mind. There are some crystals out there that when you squeeze them, they generate electricity, or when you put electricity into them, they change their shape. And this is incredible to me. Um, and so they've taken, this is actually a really, really uh, reliable, um, thing. And so you can use that to be an actuator. 
Um, these are probably in like your force transducers or your force platforms that you're using to collect uh, data. They're used in kind of your hearing aids and things. They work at incredibly high frequencies, like kilohertz. Um, but they have really, um, they are really small, which is nice, and they can generate really large forces. But they also have some disadvantages in that they have low displacements. Um, they require really high voltages, and then they have a lot of different failure modes. So they're brittle, fragile, and then um, they have a lot of depolarization. But if what you want to do is create something that's extremely tiny and moves at an incredibly high frequency, like a robotic bee, for example, as they did at Harvard, um, piezoelectric actuation is exactly what you want. So those wings are beating so fast that you can't even tell that they're beating, and that's done with a piezoelectric actuator. There you go. It's super teeny tiny, and it goes really fast. All right, let's move on to the fluidic actuators. So Henry gave a fantastic uh, description of fluidic actuators, so I'm not going to belabor the point too much, other than you know, you're pushing fluid into an area that creates a pressure, and with that pressure, you can do work. Probably some of the most famous types of pneumatic actuators are McKibben actuators, which are also just called like artificial muscles. Um, and they are a stretchy kind of bladder, an elastic bladder that has different fibers wrapped around it in a mesh. So you take the kind of um, mesh that you would put around your electrical cables to organize them, and you place that around this elastic um, bladder. When you pressurize it, depending on the um, angle of that mesh, you get different amounts of shortening. So this is what it looks like with a McKibben. When you pressurize it, it shortens. And um, people have used these fl fluidic actuators in a lot of kind of anthropomorphic robots, including kind of replacing every single muscle that's in an arm to try and get anthropomorphic motion, um, and also actuating legged robots. But the problem with these is that uh, it's really hard to get compressed air uh, when you're out in the world. And so if what you wanna do is have an autonomous robot that can move on its own without being plugged into anything, um, you're gonna have to find a way to compress air on that robot, which is very, very difficult. Um, if you take some of these, um, these elastic bladders and you instead run the fibers horizontally, and then you put three of them together in parallel and you glue them together, you get this soft chambered pneumatic rubber actuator. And this was developed by Suzumori et al. like in the 90s or in the 2000s. And they've done some really amazing stuff with them. They call them kind of soft constrained or soft chambered robots um, by pressurizing um, one or two or three of the chambers at a time. You can get really precise movements in different directions with this soft actuator. Um, and then because it's soft, again, you can do really delicate tasks with it. And you can start to do some really precise tasks as well. And having those three chambers together really helps with kind of modeling the motion. But more recently, um, people have been doing more to customize the strain limiting fiber that is wrapped around the elastomeric enclosure. Um, so they've developed these models and equations for how much displacement you're going to be getting and in what direction, um, depending on the type of uh, angle you've got. So here's a plot from a recent paper in which they plot out all the different angles that your fiber can take and the displacements that they expect you to get with those um, angles. And so these are called fiber reinforced elastomeric enclosures. So there's that plot again, and it's got all of these fibers that are wrapped around in different orientations so they can get lots of different motions. If you take a look, they'll show you three different kind of movements. 
First is extension or compression. The next is rotation. And then you can get rotation and compression at the same time. You can also add an additional fiber and get helical motion. And by putting them in parallel, you can get much more sophisticated and um, different types of motions. Okay, so I've actually used these uh, fiber reinforced elastomeric enclosures or freeze um, for my own research. So I really wanted to understand how snake anti-predator behaviors worked. So they have these amazing thrashing behaviors and I wanna know um, how effective are they at deterring predators? So I wanted to create these robots that could be safely hunted by the predators while also being these um, very true mimics of the snake's actual behaviors. So first I had to go out into the jungle and capture a bunch of snakes. And then I recorded their behaviors. So the things that I really wanted to get were the head kink, the body curve and the tail coil, and then that rapid thrash. And then we designed the soft robots in the lab and by designing the fiber angles, it's sort of like mechanically programming them um, by placing you know, these strain limiting fibers in different places. And then when we pressurize it, we're able to get this thrashing motion um, this really rapid thrashing motion and a pretty close match to um, specific species of snake. And so we're still working on that now, but the wonderful thing is that you can mix and match a lot of these parts to get almost species specific matches for many different species with just a few parts of, um, of these soft robots. If you wanna do soft robots, but you don't want to use these strain limiting fibers, Something else you can do is cast these shapes um, for these pneumatic actuators. And if you wanna do this, I would really suggest looking at the Soft Robotics Toolkit. I think it's just softroboticstoolkit.com. Um, they have a lot of tutorials and instructions on how to do this, and they mainly use silicone rubber. Um, one thing I want you to know though, is that silicone is heavier, but it's more durable than latex. So latex is what oftentimes the McKibbins and the Freeze are using. And that's because you don't wanna to have to um, use a, a huge amount of your work just to lift and move the mass of the actuator itself. But if you don't mind having that higher pressure and you want something that's gonna be more durable, then silicone is the way to be. So George Lauder, who can't make it today, um, he shared some slides with us. Um, the first is, this kind of new fish, right? So this is the work of his PhD student, um, Dr. Wolf, who actually just um, defended yesterday. So this is a really simple, simple pneumatic device where they've got one of these flapping foils that they wanna put into the water and they wanna actuate it. So they add a soft robot to the side um, and here we go. This is this actuated, like pneumatically actuated foil. So they can put it in a flume and do all kinds of research on it. All right. Um, yeah, so if you wanna know more about that, feel free to reach out to Professor Lauder or now Dr. Wolf. Okay, so spiders, it turns out, are themselves hydraulic actuators. Um, they don't have any extensor muscles in their bodies. They just pressurize the fluid inside of their body and then it causes their legs to extend. And that's why when you see a dead uh, spider, it's usually curled up like this. And so some people have recently been using spiders themselves as actuators, like dead spiders, by just injecting fluid and changing the pressure inside of the spider to make these um, grippers and they call these necrobots. Um, it's a little gross to me, but you know, that may, that may suit your needs, who knows? Um, but So these spiders have also, the way that they've got these um, pressurized joints, they've also um, inspired these semi-soft constrained 
robots where or actuators where you put some fluid in, but you constrain most of the length of the tube, except for the part where you want the bend to occur. You pressurize it and then the bend occurs at that spot. So you're almost sort of creating a localized and controlled aneurysm. Um, this was done in 2013, but also more recently, they've done this with hazel actuators, those dielectric di fluid actuators that I told you about, um, and doing the same thing with that. Another thing you can do is create these kind of inflatable robots that evert from the inside out. And they're pretty cool. I highly recommend you checking them out. And they're all inflatable as well. The next uh, type I want to talk about is sort of vacuum power. So instead of increasing the pressure inside of your enclosure, you're reducing the pressure inside of the closure. But for that vacuum power to work, you need some kind of structure inside um, to, to retain and have that kind of strength. So a while back, there was this universal jamming gripper that was developed where you basically just put coffee grounds inside of a balloon and you can press that into something while it's pressurized, it will conform to the shape and then you create a vacuum and it will create granular jamming between the coffee grounds and it'll be able to pick that stuff up. Another one uh, you can do is this, um, origami structure inside of a balloon and you press it onto something and then you depressurize it and the origami structure conforms to the 3D shape of that object and then you can handle it. So I just want you to know that those are out there. They haven't really become bio-inspired yet, but they just exist. All right, so the next set of actuator category I wanna talk about is thermal actuators. So probably the most famous and most commonly used thermal actuator is called shape memory alloy. And this one is called nitinol. It's created by combining nickel and titanium. You put it into a specific shape and then you heat shock it into that shape. So then uh, once it's cooled down from that, you can take it and bend it into any sort of shape you want. And then as soon as you heat it up again, it will go back to its original heat shocked state. So take a look at this. Here you go, and it goes back into a paper clip, which is pretty nice. There are lots of different shapes you can put it in and it'll just go back into its native shape. And it's pretty rapid depending on the temperature. The really great thing about this is that they can have high specific force, high specific power, they're small, and you can have really customizable shapes. Um, they can also uh, be used to kind of replace muscle one-to-one -one, and you don't have to think about rotation like you would with a motor. There are some disadvantages though. Manufacturing these is really, really finicky. Just getting the consistency, it's not something you necessarily want to do at home and probably something you would want to um, buy um, from somewhere else. And they're only capable of really low frequency actuation because if you want to get it back out of that shape, you're going to need to wait for it to cool down and bleed the heat off uh, before you can actuate it again. So you're really limited by heating and cooling rates. They're also really ineffective or inefficient because like heat, there's so much loss due to heat and they're brittle and they can break. Um, so another type of thermal actuator is these carbon nanotube yarns with this high tensile strength um, and they're also like thermally actu actuated. You can also make some at home out of fishing line. So you just take some plastic fishing line and super twist it up. Um, and then you heat it with a hair dryer. Um, and then after that, each time you stretch it and then you heat it with a hair dryer, it'll go back into its shape. So I really recommend this one if you're trying to teach a class or something about um, these exotic types of actuators. It's something you can make really easily in the class. The thing is they are very unreliable and they tend to be very brittle and break. So make sure that you're not relying on them for too much. But the nice thing is that they're cheap and you can remake them again. So 
Um, I do want to show you one exception to that rule that shape memory alloys or SMAs are really slow. Um, one of my friends, YT Lin, made a robot based on these Caterpillar um, ballistic rolling, which is a really fast motion. And he ended up using SMAs to create this very fast robot. So SMAs can be fast too. All right. So Cecilia Alaski has also made um, used shape memory alloys to, and a combination of shape memory alloys actually, and these kind of um, mesh on the outside, similar to the McKibben actuators, to create these artificial muscular hydrostats or octopus tentacles. So she's made these robotic octopus-like arms. They're soft. They're controllable. They can do lots of things like grip and even safely hang out with a human being. So there's a lot of potential here for shape memory alleys, especially because they are so, so small. And the nice thing about making this kind of underwater is that, you know, the specific heat of water, you can actually bleed out a lot of that temperature um, pretty quickly. Okay. So the last type of actuator I'm gonna talk about is evaporative. And I'm just gonna go over this very briefly because it's still pretty new. Talia, I think you're on mute. Thank you. Um, sorry, I got kicked off of my internet for some reason. So um, yeah, these pine cones are hygroscopic. So that means it collects moisture from the air. And as it does that, it can change its shape. And so you can think of this as a type of actuation in response to moisture. Um, and so there've been people who've created these hygroscopic actuators. Um, this one is made out of 3D printed wood and they've actually created these like bubble pavilions where you have a whole pavilion and each of these cells opens up or closes um, due to the changes in the moisture of the air. You don't need to necessarily use um, just the moisture in the air, the, the water. You can also create polymers that swell with different types of solvents. And then when those evaporate, they can actually start to leap. So this is one that's kind of like a contact lens size. Um, it can jump many times its own height and even go upstairs. So these are not bio-inspired yet at all. Uh, I have no idea what to do with these, but I just wanted you to be aware that there's some pretty cool stuff happening in the world of actuators. Um, and yeah, I hope that there's something in here that speaks to you. And if you have any questions about actuators in general um, or how to actuate your own physical models, please feel free to reach out to Henry, George, or myself. Um, we'd be really happy to chat about actuation. So yeah, thanks so much for coming to our second workshop. Um, and yeah, we'll take any questions. Yeah, so I, I was just kind of wondering, Henry, so how, one of the things that I can't do with my pneumatic actuators is get kind of back and forth movement because mm. mine are pretty much just like a, I, they have an actuated state and they have an unactuated state and that's mm -hmm. it. And I, I either have to like increase the pressure of the fluid inside really rapidly or, and just like decrease the pressure really rapidly to get that like switching mm -hmm, between mm -hmm. states, but I can't actually do anything like have a like translation motion or gradual motion or anything, lateral undulation right. for sure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I know that you use kind of these dynamixels for your snake robot. Are there any mm -hmm. other actuators that you think would be good for getting that kind of lateral undulation? Oh. 
I've been trying to figure out a way to make like lightweight snake robots that can undulate for a long time. And I have, mm-hmm. I have been coming up blank a lot, a lot of that. Um, especially when it comes to controllability. Like I could imagine uh, having like a, like, like Zane's new fish. I, uh, mm-hmm. I could imagine something like the new fish with lots and lots and lots of chambers, but lots of chambers means lots of tubes to connect to it and then trying to get all the exactly. tubes to, to bend. Yeah. So I've never quite found mm-hmm. a good solution for that. I don't know. Um, yeah, one of the things yeah. that I was thinking about for for getting kind of different timing of motion um, mm-hmm. is they have these um, soft valves. so. One of my friends, right, Mike Vayner, yeah. made the like Octobot, soft Octobot um, mm-hmm. paper um, back in, I don't know, 2000 something, something, 2015. I, I know the one, yeah. 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 <laughs> and so the way he did it was he had these um, soft vowels in between. So there was like legs one, three, five, seven were all connected to one circuit, one fluidic circuit. And then Mm -hmm. legs two, four, six, eight were connected to another circuit. And so Mm -hmm. when one of them was pressurized, it closed off the other one. And then somehow it opened and then the other one started to get pressurized. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So they were able to get that. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, these are some of the fundamental challenges of, of, fluidic actuators for sure exactly it's just so hard and i mean uh yeah so so similar to the kicking off sort of thing hopefully maybe we'll get some things so you i know you use a lot of these um well not the brushless the other ones uh yeah, the PMSMs. For your robot the pdsm pdsm um like I, I really want to play with those things. I have one in lab and I still haven't actually gotten around to doing it because <laughs> who has time? Um, but like the thing I've never been able to get is how to control those because it's not as simple as like, here, stick it into the Arduino and import this package or, or even the Dynamixels where, yeah, it's its own language, but I go import control table and I'm done, you know? How yeah. do you figure out how to make that thing like, because it's, it's an intrinsically rotational sort of device so how, uh, that wants to spin. So how do you get it to like, I want to position my legs here and then extend and yeah. Yeah, they do a thing called like field oriented control with right, them. Yeah, yeah. Um, and basically we have these incredible um, motor driver boards that can help mm. us just translate our, um, our desires or our rotational and positional desires into Mm -hmm. the field oriented control for the PMSMs. And so Mm -hmm. we have what we call, I think they're called Modius boards. Um, Yeah. yeah. And that's, that's what we're using. They're about a hundred dollars or so per board. Um, And then you need one per um, motor. And so they go together. So like what, what are like the inputs of the Modius? Do you send it pulse width modulated signals? Do you send it a variable voltage? Like what, I what, don't what's... remember. <laughs> okay. <That's, laughs> I'll ask my students, but I don't remember yeah. exactly. Because mm-hmm. I know like the PMSMs, they only have three cables. It's nothing super complex. Okay, so three wires that come I, out. Yeah. And I assume two of those are power. Um, yeah. 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 And ah, so, okay. yeah, it's, it's not, I don't think it's, it's too hard, but so long as you have that board going with it. Okay. So Modius. Yeah. M-O-T-E-U-S. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Adding they can get a little list. finicky if you, we just had this problem where um, some of our connectors were loose, like our power connectors were loose. And then, so um, they actually shorted out the boards and totally oh. destroyed the whole thing. So make sure all Ooh. your connectors are very well connected together. Otherwise, you're going to have to pay $60 to repair them. Good to know. Okay, yeah. <laughs> That's the most <laughs> fragile part of my robot right now mm-hmm. and the most expensive. Yeah. I see. I think I, I think I found it online. Excellent. Thank you. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and um, the the 3D printing plans for the whole gearbox oh, yeah. are online. They're on my website posted right. now. Yeah. So feel free to take a mm-hmm. look. 
Oh, definitely. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, they're really fun. They're like the best fidget spinners ever. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I kind of want to make like a best practices for 3D printing gearboxes document mm -hmm. and put it mm -hmm. online because it's not super straightforward. You can't just sort of take your like maker bot and expect that it'll make the perfect gearbox every time there's a lot you can mm -hmm. do to um, create the consistency and the regularity and the precision that you need to make these um, work mm -hmm. but it's nice because they have like a slight break in and then they start to they start to rotate and then a little bit of powder of the plastic kind of builds up inside that. And it's kind of like a self lubricating like gearbox. I remember it, from your CP yeah. talk. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was really it like great. Yeah. decreases in efficiency right when you start to use them, but then like it starts to go right back up to, to the original efficiency. It's pretty great. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. That's very cool. The one thing that I thought with all of these really cool actuation techniques. It's always, to me, a little bit of a black box, how you take each of these types of actuators and actually attach them to the thing you're trying to build. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, hot glue is really great. <laughs> but <laughs> don't, don't, don't knock hot glue. Like, I love that stuff for if I don't need a tremendous amount of strength because it dissolves with alcohol. Everything, like super glue, you need acetone. And if you have 3D printed parts, Oh. goodbye to your 3d printed part but hot glue isopropyl and it comes right off so I, I had no that. idea i did not know that I didn't either. Yeah. i've been working it's, with it's hot glue a my whole super life. useful little trick i mean it's, it's still not the best it's i mean it's hot glue it's not exactly <laughs> but if you I don't just hot glued a, spring, a potentiometer to to mm. a, to a rotating thing yeah. that i needed oh, it's, last it's yesterday like duct tape but, <laughs> yep see that's awesome I think my lab bench is about to get a lot cleaner. I yeah. didn't know all I needed was to put ethanol on there. Yeah, yeah, just a little bit of ethanol and it'll, like it doesn't even need to dissolve the whole blob of hot glue. It'll like wick into things and yeah. then it'll just yeah. pop the chunk of hot glue straight off. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's a great tip. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> In an answer to your question, um, I think, uh, for a lot of these like soft things and um, yeah, and a lot of times you'll have like cables and stuff. Um, sometimes it's hard when you have these strain limiting fibers and you have something that's soft, like if you pull on it too much, you might actually cut through the thing that you're trying to actuate. Mm -hmm. um, and so I have a paper from I think like 2012, 2013 or something where I made a soft orthotic for like a baby's foot. And I was using Kevlar thread. We were pulling on Kevlar thread to actuate the ankle. Um, and to do that, I actually created these little channels um, that were um, deformable, but they were um, a much more hard material than um, the soft orthotic itself. And it helped prevent any kind of like wire induced kind of like rope burn from happening. Right. Oh, that's and really we just amazing. sewed those in. Yeah, I, I like mm -hmm. forced the lab to buy a, a sewing machine and then I put Kevlar thread through it so I could sew with Kevlar to make that. Oh, that's longer. cool. Yeah. But I mean, with the with the fiber reinforced Elastic American closures, the freeze, you just paint with latex paint, which is the same thing you use to make like monster masks. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And you just paint that on and then you can like glue them together. You can glue them to other things. Like they'll go on anything. And they're so safe for animals to interact with. I actually took one home and have my dog play with it. And like the dog loves it. <laughs> That's like cool. That. Yeah. And they're lightweight. So I shipped them over to Peru so we could use them out in the wild. Mm -hmm. Nice. They'll fit in your in your carry on luggage. I I wore one as a belt to a sick bee once when I gave a talk, and I just like untied it from my waist and threw it into the audience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> Actuators and theater. Yeah, <laughs> that's our next workshop. Yeah. Next Friday. But 
<laughs> for for our 3D printed actuator, we're using a lot of like press fit fittings. And so we're just like getting the rotor and like pressing it into another thing. And it's just the friction of that connection um, that causes the the um, the gear to move. And that's why it's so important to have the precise fit between the metal thing and the 3D printed thing. What type of printer do you use for your- A Prusa. Boxes? Yeah, okay. just so an is, FDM is a, Prusa. Oh, so it's just an FDM, okay, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a $700 um, 3D okay, printer. Okay. Just, that's a, just an FDM, tabletop. Though, okay. Yeah, so that's for the majority of it. Or... Mm -hmm. So there's one piece, which um, actually two pieces, the piece that goes to the rotor and then the piece that holds the stator. Um, those two need to be printed with a high temperature um, material. Like it needs to be able to take higher temperatures, whether that's mm -hmm. a high temp resin or a high temp nylon, um, something like that. It doesn't matter just so long as it's higher temperature. So we printed that on the form three using um, SLA and it was a high temp resin. Mm -hmm. Oh, speaking of the, the printer stuff, I'm not sure if I showed you all this last time. So I tried yeah. out that DLP printer and so it's missing a few bones because the, the bones are here. They just they just you know, fell off in the course mm -hmm. of printing because it's a snake skull. So it's like a loose collection of bones yeah. around a brain case. But there's no, um, so this was my, my attempt on a Saturn S uh, DLP printer, which is like 500 bucks compared to God only knows what form labs cost now. Um, <laughs> but I'm quite happy with it. I haven't done mechanical tests yet, um, but uh, so far so good. <laughs> I'm thinking of That's making the awesome. switch completely. Yeah. <laughs> nice. That mm -hmm. sounds great. Maybe we should uh, wrap it yep. up. All right. Thanks sounds for coming. Good. Yeah, thanks, thanks for coming everyone. everyone.